Welcome to the Real Estate Marketing Podcast. My name is Jerome Lewis. I'm your host for today. The Real Estate Marketing Podcast is a podcast where we talk marketing, tech, business, and leadership. We talk these things for real estate agents, real estate investors, and real estate entrepreneurs. The Real Estate Marketing Podcast is a podcast that has two purposes. Purpose number one, to educate and inform our audience and listeners. Purpose number two, tied to spotlight you, your business, your service, or your product in a way that provides value to you, including market exposure and content creation. With that, we have a very special guest, Todd Piggott. As principal and president, Todd Piggott oversees Zinc Financial and the Zinc Income Fund. Founded in 2007, Zinc Financial is a licensed lender having originated and serviced close to $1 billion in loans with a loss ratio of less than one eighth percent. The Zinc Income Fund was started in 2020 as a vehicle for investors to benefit from Zinc Financial's lending. Prior to Zinc, Todd held the position of president at one of the largest interior and exterior maintenance companies in the California Central Central Valley. Todd, welcome to the show. I'm excited that you're here. Hey, Jerome, thank you for having me today. I consider it an absolute honor to be a part of your program today. I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely, Todd. Thank you so much. So I just read off your bio, your professional bio. What I like to do is I normally like to have the guests break that down and take us through their journey. So Todd, tell us a little bit about how you got to where you got to today in your own words. All right. Well, I'll keep this somewhat short. I was born in Southern California and I started my journey down there as a young child living in Anaheim, California. My dad was vice president of Pacific Life Investments out of Newport Beach. We moved to Fresno probably in the late 70s. Uh, my parents ended up separated at that time, and we ended up on a very uh, a poor path with my mother. I ended up on welfare, very broke. Um, I did graduate with outstanding grades from Columbus High School, almost a 3.8 GPA. Ended up at Fresno State, where I specialized in construction and finance. Played water polo and swimming, but I still had a, uh, uh, a, a very, uh, very poor uh, beginning. Uh, so at one point, I ended up uh, quitting my only job at that point, which was at a sporting goods store. Um, I had about $17 to my name in the degree program at Fresno State uh, at that time. And my mother was obviously very destitute as well. So what I did at that time is I I, uh, I took that $17 and went home in my 1972 Ford pickup truck, cried all afternoon on what I was going to do to make a living at that time. So I borrowed my mom's uh, vacuum, borrowed it, and borrowed some black trash bags out of the garage. At that time, water polo at Fresno State ended at various times, depending on the day of the week, by our coach, Harold Zane, 5, 6, 7, or even 8 o'clock p.m. So at the end of the day, I wasn't quite sure when I was going to get out of water polo practice. I was studying construction and finance there at Fresno State. So I needed an occupation that I could kind of do on my own hours. So I borrowed my mom's vacuum, trash bags, and I went knocking door to door to try to clean offices for a living. And the first month, I ended up with two or three clients. Those clients were Double B Produce at 63 a month and a few others. By the end of the third month, I had cleared almost $810 from my $17 I started with. <clears throat> I then took that uh, company and I built it over three states between 500 and 1,000 employees. And I sold that company in 2006. We were one of the largest uh, janitorial exterior parking lot sweeping, parking lot striping, pressure washing, uh, graffiti removal companies in California at the time. I took that money and then I rolled it the bank. My passion was always to be into real estate or uh, fixing distressed properties or things of this nature. So when I sold that company, um, I started in the real estate venture full time. Prior to that, I had done it full time. I had bought multifamily as well as residential, repositioned those properties and then sold them to earn a profit. So now that I had sold the exterior business uh, facilities maintenance company, I rolled that into zinc full time. I began buying distressed properties, repairing those properties, and then reselling those properties. So to date, as of today, I have done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fix and flip uh, to the tune of over $100 million. Um, then what I did is I decided to lend my money out to other entrepreneurs uh, that are also in the business of buying distressed properties, rehabbing them, and reselling them. We are now one of the largest uh, lenders in the state for financing distressed properties. To date, we've done over a billion dollars of lending to young entrepreneurs out there who are looking for financing uh, debt on their projects in order to buy a property and fix it and rehab it. So our breadth of knowledge here is very, very deep. We're one of the largest fix and flip operators in the state, over 100 million. We're also one of the largest lenders in the state, near slightly over a billion dollars. 
Then what we did is we created our own mortgage fund with a sub REIT feature. And this is, this is just great. Uh, we we developed a mortgage fund has excellent tax benefits uh, that investors can invest alongside with me. So our mortgage fund, uh, zincinvesting.com allows investors out there, high net worth individuals who are looking for um, excellent security coupled with good return on their equity to participate with me. The fund is fully secured with first lien positions against the underlying collateral. Uh, we have right now, as of today, 30 to 40 million in our fund. We take this money and then we deploy that out in loans against uh, the properties we lend on. This enables investors out there to passively invest alongside of me in our fund uh, for which I have my own money in as well to lend to entrepreneurs across the state and other states, adjoining states as well, uh, for, for excellent income potential, excellent return on investment. Our fund throws off about 8% um, and then uh, allows uh, our end borrowers to also realize the benefit of that, being able to borrow that money uh, for distressed properties that they intend to fix and flip and then resell. For the property. So we got, we got per, a pretty good thing going here. With the billion dollars in lending and 100 million in fix and flip and our zinc income fund, um, it's turned to be quite the platform A very, very few losses. Our investors are very, very happy with the yield they get on our fund. And our borrowers are also very happy because uh, one of the best paths to real estate success is the ability to uh, get cash. That's that's obviously the number one, uh, number one um uh, prohibiting factor is you have to have money to unfortunately be in this line of work, either debt or equity or some form of your own family and friends. And we can enable that for young entrepreneurs to borrow from us. So uh, that's a little bit of my introduction. And I appreciate the opportunity to share that with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so, uh, one of the things that you mentioned was the fact that you always had a passion for real estate. Can you tell us why? Like what drew you to real estate? What, what was the reasoning and what's the story behind that? You know, that was at a really young age. I, I would say probably high school. Um, I, I was, uh, there's a couple things that drew me, two, two, two predominant factors drew me to this. Number one, I grew up when my parents ended up separated, uh, very poor. Uh, the church brought us Christmas gifts. Uh, our dinners consisted of typically Stouffer's, TV meals, things of this nature. We had no air conditioning. And it was during this time that I realized I did not want to live the rest of my life in some form of poverty, living paycheck to paycheck. That was the cue that I need to do something else for financial independence. I consider the term of financial independence not necessarily monetary. I consider it freedom of lifestyle. So I wanted to be at a point at a very young age where I did not want to live as though I was living in poverty. I wanted to be at a point where I had freedom. And so uh, that, that real estate is a vehicle that can uh, allow me to, uh, to, to do that. The second thing that drew me to this business was um, um, uh, freedom during the day. And so with real estate, uh, you op op often have the ability to work some office hours, doing spreadsheets, calculations, email correspondence. By the same token, you're allowed to get outside go visit a project, go visit contractors, walk a property. And I really like that aspect of it. I would never be an accountant. I would never be an attorney where I'm in the office all day long, staring at paperwork. Um, I, I'm kind of an outdoorsy guy. I ride mountain bikes. I visit the mountains. I do a lot of hiking, water polo, swimming and things of this nature. And so real estate allows me that. In other words, some outside capacity. Nothing is more fantastic than driving to a property, walking a property, working with a contractor and being able to take this property from re disrepair to uh, a wonderful remodeled happy home that can eventually be sold to a first time home buyer. So for two reasons, I love this industry. I'm extremely passionate about it. Number one, it's the one industry that provides financial freedom. Number two, from a quality of work life, you have the ability to intermix some office and some outside activity. And I think those are both of the reasons that I chose this line of work. I will tell you, I absolutely love it. Um, I don't want to own a grocery store, a car lot, or an insurance agency. If there's one thing that I really want to do, it's what I'm doing now. I love fixing and flipping properties, and I love lending on distressed properties for other entrepreneurs to borrow from us. I think it's absolutely an excellent vehicle to create wealth, also an excellent excellent vehicle to create a good quality of work life. I'm very happy to be here. 
Thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. I love real estate too. And um, I love real estate, but I also love marketing. That's, you know, I combine those two together and I enjoy a great life. Big part of what you said is like the freedom. I absolutely love my freedom and being able to do what it is that I want to do, having some control over my life. Uh, With that, uh, one of the things that you mentioned is um, that you often hear in the real estate space, right? Is that you don't need money to be involved in real estate investing. And there is some truth to it, but most of the time when people say that, they're not following it they're not telling the full story. So I would like to hear from you, right? Cause you mentioned that, like you do need some money. So give us your perspective on not needing money. Do we need money? Do we not need money? Help us understand how that works. Uh, that's a great question. That is a question that is posed to me constantly at conferences on podcasts or a variety of other mechanisms. Um, having mm-hmm. lent over $1 billion, which is a very large number. I can tell you mm-hmm. two things. Credit is important. Uh, For those out there that teach credit is not important, I disagree fully. We look at credit heavily. Um, If a person has extremely poor credit, they cannot pay their utility bills, they cannot pay their Macy's credit card, their chance of getting a loan from us as one of the largest lenders in this space is is next to zero. Um, If you're not able to control and or manage your personal finances, the last thing a person like myself is going to do is give you four hundred thousand dollars and then have uh be stuck in a marriage that i want to extract myself from because you cannot manage that ability so credit is is very important Number two, cash it is important uh we do not lend money to entrepreneurs that have no money and no credit that is that is not something we do um, I have often found that our competitors in the space or other competitive lenders also do not do that. As a matter of fact, I have not found, I have not found in my 20 years of doing this one lender ever that loans money uh, without regard to credit and uh, without regard to what I call liquidity, your own cash. Yes, we look at credit and yes, we look at your own cash. What does it take? You don't need a lot. We ask for 10 to 20% down on the acquisition price of the property. Uh, that is uh, not a lot. We will finance up to 80 to 90% of that acquisition cost. So yes, you don't need all of your own money, but you do need some money. We find that if there is a contribution of capital from an investor or a borrower, that the alignment of interests to an an excellent exit or uh, a path to success is heightened by them having their own money in the deal. So regardless of the LTV, Regardless of the equity position, we always, always, always require some cash from that borrower in order to create a meaningful alignment of interest to make sure that that transaction is successful as well as good credit. All right. So while you were introducing yourself and taking us through your journey, you mentioned uh, you went from fix and flip to then lending. Could you take like why make that shift? Like, did you stop enjoying the fix and flip? Did you was there more potential over here? Like, what was your thought process and how did that work? That's a great question. When I started in this business, uh, gosh, back in the mid 90s, I was buying multifamily units, small Mm -hmm. cap, rehabilitating those, rent rolling those up and then selling those. Um, Then I got into SFR, single family residential properties. I started buying distressed properties, rehabilitating those, and then selling those to earn a profit. Uh, We did a lot of this back in the 07, 08, and 09 when there was a lot of inventory uh, to be bought, repositioned, and then resold. I will tell you that I absolutely love fixing and flipping properties. It's the joy of my life. I would probably rather do that than go to a concert or a vacation. Nothing is more fulfilling than, than going to a property that's in bad shape with broken drywall, uh, a, a distressed roof, a backyard with a bunch of junk in it, uh, cabinets that have been ripped off, spray painted graffiti, squatters, REO, probate situation, you name it, I've seen it, drug houses. And I love that. And so I started fixing and flipping myself and I really enjoy that. And to this day, I still like it. But unfortunately for me, it was an inability to scale that on a large, large level. It is very difficult, very difficult to scale rehabbing properties to a a very large level across multiple counties, if not multiple states, especially in today's market. What do I mean by that? Labor is tight. Talent is tight. Uh, Supply chain distribution is somewhat disrupted. So the ability to create um, a very large scale uh, fix and flip operation 
is, is something that I have not seen done and something that I was having some complexity in doing. So the next step naturally was to become a lender. And that's what we do today. Uh, I do, you know, 20 to 40 loans per month on fix and flip properties. It would be impossible for us to have an operation where we could do 20 to 40 fix and flip uh, properties a month. That simply is, is unmanageable at least in today's climate. And so I naturally progressed to the next level, which is lending that also enables uh, my investors or backers, I should say, to realize good yeah. passive income in our fund, be able to use a good good yield there. So uh, that was kind of the, the transgression of why I ended up where I am. It was basically a scaling mechanism. We're in 35 states. We, we lend in 35 states. We're almost across the entire country. Well, uh, that can be accomplished through scale lending but very difficult from a fix and flip operation level. So we find the most successful, we, we see this time and time again, time and time again. We see the most successful operators in the fix and flip space are people that do this. They have good credit. They have some liquidity. They know their local geographical area very well, typically within three hours of their residence. And they know that market well, and they typically fix a few properties at a time over a year period. That is by far our most successful operator here. They're local, they're, they're, they're well-groomed, they know their market very well, and they typically are small to medium level. Large operators that are trying to scale this thing usually run into some form of problem. Talent, labor, management, supply, becomes very difficult to manage offsite and in geographical regions that are in excess of three hours of your home site. And you don't know the market conditions there. So in California, it's very different from Texas and very different from Pennsylvania. How do I have my pulse in Pennsylvania? I don't know. And so the, the fix and flip operators that we like to support and that we find that are most successful are local knowledge-based, local territory. They have their feet on the ground. They're at their projects. They're active in managing their projects and they have those attributes. So, uh, you know, that's, I hope that answers your question on how I grew up and how I transformed into lender. I also hope it understands that we're, we're fix and flip operators are most successful today. It does. Um, so I have a question because typically in this, you know, I've done a lot of interviews. I've been around a lot of real estate investors, a lot of real estate agents. And uh, I actually like, cause I do all of my pockets in like one day, right? I uh, just saw what one of my guests, we run like a short term rental uh, podcast. And she mentioned the fact that I forget what she mentioned, but the most the most difficult thing to do is like to get those contractors and to scale those contractors. And I was like, that's actually the most difficult part. That's why I never really wanted to fix and flip because of the talent. You, It's just hard to scale. You start to manage people. And my experience, it's just been hard. So, you know, I'm like, I don't want to do that. That's not what I'm interested in. So I'd like to hear from you. Like, how did you develop a passion, right? Most people dread fix and flips. It's like, oh my God, I have to do this. I got to do all of this stuff. How did you develop a passion for fix, I've never heard anybody say that in all my years of being in an industry, and I haven't been around that long, seven years, but I've never heard anybody say, I just love fix and flips. So I'd like to hear how that I came love about it, for you. Man. I love it. I love it. $100 million is a big number. Hundreds of properties. I absolutely love it. If I, Hey, if my doctor gives me news today, you know, I have five years to live. I'm really doing this very impromptu. I haven't even planned this out in my head. If my doctor says today, I only got five years to live, you know, what do you want to do? I'm probably going to go fix and flip properties. Nothing is more enjoyable for me than to find a property, probate, uh, REOs, uh, long-term occupants that are, these are people that have lived there 30 and 40 years that have not fixed the property at all. Uh, rent Rental properties squatter drug houses when i pull up in my white pickup truck and i find this property and it's in complete distress the, the neighbors are upset because this we all we all have these properties in our neighborhoods every single one of us has a property like this in our neighborhood when i pull up that property and the neighbors are going oh my gosh can somebody do something with this house and and there's squatters in there nothing is more enjoyable than getting those squatters out walking that property which is an absolute dump bringing in my crew and starting with the foundational aspects of it, getting the pest report, getting the roof under control, getting the foundation of electrical and things like this in order, and then moving through the rest of the project. We can fix and flip a property that's mostly cosmetic 
typically in about six weeks, maybe eight weeks. It is enjoyable. I love walking to that property and saying, boy, this thing's junky. Let's widen the wall. Let's widen this door opening. Let's replace the front door. Uh, let's take this thing back to drywall, reposition the fireplace, take the pool, drain it. We put on Leslie's pool paint, bright blue, $75 a gallon. We get the pool, pool recleaned. We get it back to drywall. We put in fresh cabinets. We put in a new cramp. We put in a double stainless steel sink, a new kitchen faucet. We even outfit it with what we call clean steel appliances. What's that? It's fake stainless steel. Stainless steel is very expensive. We use what's called clean steel. It's simply a, a, a cheaper way, but yet the, the actual appliance functions the same and it looks great. At the end of the day, here's what we've done. This is so cool. I'm happy because I got to get outside and go fix the property and do something I enjoy. The neighbors love us. The last house we did, this, this neighbor lady brought us a basket of fresh lemons. She was so happy to see the transformation of that house. So I win. My neighbor, the neighbors of, the, of that community win. My, my borrower wins because he was able to realize a profit of twenty-five dollars to $45,000. My investors in my zinc income fund win because they can earn passive income of 8 to 10% on their investment. And then secondly, a new homeowner wins because they got a, they got a nicely new remodeled home that they get to move in and enjoy. So it's kind of a win-win, win-win. The investors in our fund win with good passive income. The neighbors win. They love it. The new family moves in. I get to get outside and go fix a property and improve a community. And, and the guy that we loaned money to also gets to win because he needs to make a few bucks. So I, I love it. It's a super, super uh, fascinating journey uh, to take each house and, and transform it into a, a newly rehabbed structure. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, what's some advice you would give someone that's like, man, I dread being in fix and flip. I'm trying to get my way out. Like, how would you like if you could coach them? one or two things you would tell them to, you know, get to the other side, maybe enjoy it or make it less painful. What would you tell them? There's a couple of things I would probably tell people. Number one, mm -hmm. I think it's very important to get some experience with a good operator that you can go out and get your feet on the ground and get direct experience. I usually suggest two years. I'm not a big fan of going to seminars that are air conditioned, that you bought a CD and that you, you perhaps learned something perhaps, but reality is the easy part is sitting there in air conditioning and, and, you know, learning that is nothing compared to real life experience. 70% uh, of people leave this business after their third transaction. They don't make it. Why don't they make it? They don't make it because they lacked the true experience on the front end. There's only three things that are going to happen on every single transaction every single transaction. It's going to cost more than you think. It's going to take longer than you think. And it's going to be more of a hassle than you think. Getting contractors to show up, do the job, finish it within the price they quoted is an art. It is very difficult to accomplish in real life. So although on paper or at that school you went to, they provided some good examples, maybe some good spreadsheets and some good narrative there's nothing that will replace the true life experience for having your feet on the ground and actually muddling through this process. It is hard. This is not get rich quick. This is get rich slow. And so my advice to anybody wanting to enter this business from a guy who has fixed and flipped hundreds of properties and is now one of the largest lenders in the space. My advice to anybody wanting to get into this is it can provide you financial freedom and it is, it is an excellent way to create wealth. However, nothing will replace good experience. My advice is to work for somebody for a couple of years, learn the ins and outs, the pitfalls, because unfortunately, unfortunately, lessons in this business can be very, very expensive on the front end. 20, 40, $100,000. We have a girl yesterday, a yesterday that's called our office crying, crying. Uh, she cannot exit the property. She's going to lose $100,000. Uh, we are trying to help her with some relief. But the reality is she's crying. She's upset. This was her first transaction. She put up all of her money. She's not done this before. She made some mistakes and now she's going to lose money. I don't like to see that. It's very, very disheartening. Had this person per succumbed 
to working for somebody a little bit and getting a year or two under her belt, she might not have yes. lost this money. She will undoubtedly leave this industry. And, and obviously that's not something we want to see. So my advice to any entrepreneur out there is talking to somebody who's done it, hundreds of properties, I've seen it all, is go get some experience in working with somebody and learn the ins and outs uh, prior to venturing out on yourself. Thank you, Ty, for sharing that. Uh, do you have any recommendations? Do you have like a course, a book, anything like that, a YouTube channel where people can come? Because like sometimes people are like, go get some, go find some information. And people are like, well, I, I want it from you, though. So like from your perspective, like, do you have recommendations, a course, book, anything that you would recommend for somebody that's trying to learn? Like, OK, I like Todd and I'm going to take what he said and apply it. But I want to go to his references and his resources, his information. We do have blogs. We do have a YouTube okay. channel. Our company is ZincFinancial.com. Zinc, Z is in zebra, I is in igloo, N is in Nancy, C is in cap. ZincFinancial.com is our website for borrowers. And I invite them there to learn about our, uh, our, our, um, our, our posts on our blog, as well as a variety of um, uh, YouTubes that we do there. They can find everything that they want from a learning experience right there. They can also uh, fill out a loan application there online. And on there is also our email as well as our phone number. If they would like to call our office, they can learn anything about our products, our loan products or our lending programs. So there's a wealth of knowledge there. We do do what's uh, called Fix and Flip Fridays, where we uh, give little tips to our borrowers on things from roofing uh, to, to, uh, to a variety of other topics for entry level or moderate level investors who are looking to get into this space. So I really invite them to visit zincfinancial.com for our borrowers who are looking to learn and or borrow money. For investors out there who wish to invest alongside me, uh, I uh, open the opportunity for them to visit zincinvesting.com. Um, zincinvesting.com is strictly dedicated to accredited investors who want to passively invest alongside with me in this loan product. 8 to 10% guaranteed monthly distribution, uh, all secured by first lien position, nominal if any losses in our fund. So we basically have two avenues here, uh, zincinvesting.com for our investors who went to back with us, invest alongside with me in this loan product. And then we have our borrowers who can visit zincfinancial.com mm -hmm. as a learning experience for blogs, posts, and other uh, learning, learning things there, as well as uh, the chance to borrow money if they so desire. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, could you tell us about two of your favorite case studies or two of your favorite deals? Let's, two let's, yeah. Favorite, yeah, two of my favorite deals. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you one recently here. We have this uh, amazing property in uh, San Diego. Um, uh -huh. And this property had fallen out of escrow two or three times because of its disrepair. It was built in 1920. And, and it had a faulty foundation that was on a pier block foundation. The inside was uh, dating back to the 30s and 40s. Um, the person who sold it to us was actually uh, the son of the parents who were original owners who had both passed away. So we walked through this property in San Diego overlooking this, this uh, valley from the 1920s and 1930s all original, the floor, the fireplace, everything, but it was in very, very poor condition. The foundation was not even stable. Um, we opened up, took up the carpet and we opened up what was a, uh, a door down to the basement or the under part of the house. All these tools were down there from the 20s, 30s and 40s. It was super, super fascinating. The screwdrivers, the saws, the light bulbs were even from the 30s and 40s. And, it, and a long story short is we, we took our crews there and we put them up in hotels. And we completely remodeled the outside. We put in all new windows. We uh, we rehabbed the original clay roof. Um, we structurally improved the pier block uh, foundation. Um, we took the, the floors back to their original wood floor. We had the fireplace recreated. And then we brought in some new cabinetry and we widened the walls. So one thing you'll notice in houses from the 20s and 30s and 40s is they're built very small rooms and very small uh, door openings and small hallways. So we always try to open those up, make them a little bit uh, more open. So we opened up the house, stuck on some new windows, created this really cool courtyard with a water fountain, rebuilt the structural foundation, uh, fixed the clay roof. And then we sold this to a very nice uh, couple 
both in the education system that love this house today, more of a mission style home, very, very, uh, very, very successful project. The place looks amazingly beautiful. Very proud of that. Uh, some of our pitfalls have always been candidly with uh, drug houses. Uh, with a drug house, uh, I will tell you, you never know what you're going to get. And drug houses provide uh, their own pitfall and danger. Uh, getting the occupants out can be uh, somewhat difficult, especially in today's environment. So previous to COVID, dating back 20 years, evictions or removal of occupants not entitled to be there could be accomplished in a very short period of time, sometimes as little as three weeks. Today, with the abundance of laws out there protecting occupancy, it can be quite a challenge to get occupants out, sometimes up to a year. So a drug house with people that are doing illegal activities can be sometimes challenging. Being able to get rid of them through the legal process is uh, very, very difficult. And then when you're they're out, you're left with often um, something that smells very bad, looks very bad. There's often paraphernalia there that you didn't would not touch. And so those types of uh, transactions can be very difficult. Um, you just have to work through them. And that's, again, why I say experience in this business is very, very helpful if you can get it. OK, give us one more of your favorite uh, favorite deals. Uh, absolutely. Uh, this house in um, Clovis that we did, this is a, another house. Uh, this house had renters in there that had not paid rent in almost two years. The owner was extremely frustrated. It was an entry level house that was a three bedroom, two bath located near a Costco and a school. The bones of the structure were fine, but the roof and the inside were in terrible condition based on these renters not paying rent in almost uh, two years. Cars were parked on the front lawn. Christmas lights were all over the outside in the middle of summer. The grass had reached a point of 18 inches and there was all types of car parts in the front driveway with oil dripping down the driveway into it. We pulled up and looked at this house. The neighbors came out and were wondering who we were. And we told them we were in the process of buying this house and rehabilitating it to a new uh, remodeled home. They were absolutely fantastic about that concept. We took over this house. We negotiated a cash for keys settlement with the occupants. They refused. We then proceeded with a formal eviction. And within three to four months, we were able to uh, uh, finalize that eviction, remove the occupants. We removed almost 240 cubic yard bins of trash from the inside, the outside. Uh, multiple illegal products from the inside were dumped into the dumpster. Uh, nothing toxic, of course, just activity that was uh, not something that you and I would do. The roof had three layers of comp shingles on it. So we had to strip the roof, get back to plywood, and then put on a single layer roof. We completely took the entire house down to drywall. We rebuilt it with a new little uh, nook, breakfast nook, uh, with cherry wood cabinets. We brought in all new appliances, created a whole new cabinet kitchen. We took the uh, the closet we created into a pantry the door had a pantry emblem on the glass on the inside we completely remodeled the uh the bathrooms with all new uh, vanity that we found with new lighting new tile floors etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, we put carpet in the bedrooms uh, then we put um, fake wood throughout the halls the kitchen and the family rooms we painted the inside inside fireplace with black paint and then we created, uh, we stripped the paint that was on the outside of the fireplace down to its natural brick. We put up a fake faux beam in the, in the family room. These can be bought from Amazon. They're actually fake wood made out of styrofoam, but they look amazing. So we put a fake faux, faux beam. Uh, we put in a, 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 a ceiling fan. The house looked amazing. We put it on the market for almost $100,000 more than what we paid for it. Our rehab was 40. We stood to make $60,000 on it. We had over 20 offers within the first week to buy this house. We sold it to a first time homeowner, first time family with two small kids. And I think them and the neighbors threw a block warming party when they moved in. So this is another example where we take a house with basic squatters, with overgrown lawn, cars parked in the front, oil dripping down the driveway, an engine and a transmission sitting in the middle of the driveway. We were able to turn this into a brand new home with fresh uh, bluegrass in the front that had been rolled in, uh, fresh bark, five new fresh squat, uh, plants, new sprinklers, and a beautiful interior home uh, sold to a first time. Uh, really, nothing's more exciting than seeing that family 
excited with two young kids coming to this house. It looks great. It smells great. Everything works. They're excited. They're in tears. They finally realized the opportunity of home ownership. The neighborhood's happy and we're happy because we made 30 or 40 grand. It's just a great feeling. Nice. Nice. Thank you. It, it sounds beautiful. Um, next questions are a little bit selfish. Okay. Right. So, uh, I have two questions for you. It's selfish for me so I can find out how I can help my guests, but it's also for anybody that wants to reach out to you, right? You can't just yeah. ask people for things. Sometimes you, you, you can lead with value, you know? So first question is how can someone add immediate value to you or your business? And if you need an example, you just let me know. How can somebody add immediate value to our business? Uh, we are always on the search for good talent in, okay. in today's market. Uh, finding uh, good people with good talent is our biggest challenge. So finding good partners, good partners that can help us in a variety of ways, uh, outside marketing sources, outside deal finding sources, the ability for people to find us uh, good, good deals to fund, good, good borrowers to fund to, or good investors. I would call it partners, talent, the human component, I should say, is our, our challenge today. Uh, and if somebody would like to add value, it would be from the humanistic part. Uh, you know, to be candid with you, um, finding great software today is not hard. Finding good computers today is not hard. Finding decent office space is not hard. Uh, finding good people with with good work ethic, with good talent, whether it's an outside partner or an inside partner that can create value for us by bringing us good, solid borrowers or good, solid investors is probably our biggest challenge today. We need, uh, you know, people that can provide those two channels to us. Great investors for our fund uh, is 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 a great uh, a great channel for somebody to add value to us as well as finding us a great borrowers both of those are are uh you know important to us uh, we're very very strict i should have mentioned this earlier we're very very strict in working only with good people or the right people uh we we don't work with what i call jerks um again people that are very difficult dropping profanity poor credit just bad people um we we don't work with them on on any level we extract ourselves uh, from that scenario as quick as we can. Uh, if there's one piece of advice I could give myself when I'm 18 years old, uh, always, always, always at any cost, work with good people that have good intentions, that have good values and good transparency and good ethics. Every problem can be solved. Every problem can be solved. If you have on your team good people with good agendas, with good transparency that want to work for a common goal. People that are toxic, dropping profanity that are not good are people that we extract from very quickly. Okay. Uh, next question is very similar. How can someone add long-term value to you or your business? Long-term value. Uh, we are looking for long-term borrowers as well as long-term investors. Um, partners, I, I think I would answer that kind of the same way to be very frank with you. Uh, okay. we, we need long-term partners, both internal and external to create value for us. We need uh, long-term, uh, long-term solutions. Again, I would probably go back to the humanistic side. Um, I don't, I, I, again, I don't need a long-term solution for software. I don't need a long-term solution to our office desk, a long-term solution on, on, on providing uh, value to us would be from a borrowing concept. Do we have a long-term relationship? We want long-term relationships with our borrowers. We want them to use this over and over again. And we want our investors also to be long-term committed to our cause as well. Uh, being that we do have a successful track record on both fronts, very, very successful. Um, that's that's where our challenge faces us today. It's hard. T today's, today's communication between humans is different than it was three years ago, five years and 10 years ago. So we've lost an element a slight bit of the element, the communication uh, and relationship aspect has changed. Um, we're very good with uh, Zoom today, team meetings, and a lot of like electronic relationships, I guess I would have called it. But the humanistic mm -hmm. side is somewhat broken down a little bit. And that's that's a little bit challenging because at the end of the day, both of what we do, both on the lending as well as, as, well as the fix and flip, both require 
massive human interaction. And so that's uh, that's a little bit that's changed. You're not going to fix and flip a property. You're not unless you have excellent interpersonal communication skills and excellent human skills. It is not going to be done from a laptop, a cell phone or some remote remote process. It's just not going to happen. So finding good humans with good personal traits, good communication, good personal humanistic skills to help in that or even on our borrowing side or even with our investors is is, is, the, is the number one challenge we face today, long-term, long-term. All right, thank you for sharing that. Um, what is one question you wish I had asked you and how would you have answered? The one question I have, what are the three to, I, I guess this is the one question I have and I, and I saw this, uh, what's the one question I have? What are the, you know, I say this to my kids. I say this to my kids who are now entering their adulthood. Uh, they're just now getting out of college and starting their adult. Well, one of them is still in college. What are the three to five things that you do every single day to help you be successful? You know, what are the three most basic things that you do every single day? And I tell my kids this over and over and over again. Exercise, wake up early, eat right, be willing to learn, work hard and always do the right thing when nobody's watching. If you wake up early at six o'clock, which is what I do, get on your Peloton and exercise, eat right, have the tenacity and the grit to work hard every single day, eight to 10 hours, and always do the right thing. Those characteristics will take you very, very far. I grew up very poor. I grew up with $17. Now I'm a multimillionaire. How? I'll tell you what, surround yourself with the right people. Get your exercise in, get your diet in, wake up early, grind it out every single day and always do the right thing. Extract yourself from bad situations and always contribute by always doing the right thing. It's a really fulfilling life if you can wake up and do those three to five things every day. And so I wish back at 18, you know, I, I made some mistakes. We all did. Uh, you know, my diet was terrible. I gained a bunch of weight. I drank entirely too much. I mean, it was never massively out of control, but I learned that excess alcohol, excess eating, you know, set, get, waking up at nine o'clock and, and hanging around you know, people that aren't going to be successful is not going to get you anywhere. So guys, I say this to my kids. I would say this to a fix and flip, flip operator. I'll say this to my investor. I work with people, my, my largest investor is worth $400 million and my, my entry level borrower has 25 grand. So I see all spectrums of wealth. And I will tell you that the most successful people that I run into, both in my investor side and in our fund, as well as in our operator side, uh, operator or borrower side, have some common traits, have some common traits. They stay fit, they eat well, they wake up early, they grind it out and they always do the right thing. And they're very transparent in all of their dealings, both personal and professional. I talked to a guy yesterday. He is one of my investors. He's over in Carmel, California, and he's looking at a $25 million house that is three doors down from Brad Pitts. I know this person very, very well. He's very wealthy. He's very successful. He wakes up every morning at 530. He plays pickleball. He lifts weights three times a week. Uh, he has been in farming and he works very long hours and he works very hard in farming, but he always manages to keep his fitness, his diet, his early mornings rises and his work ethic very, very strong. And as a result, he's created a lot of wealth for himself and others. He also is very, very stable in his, in his faith and his business dealings with everybody. He's just very transparent and above board. If it smells bad, he usually leaves. And so I guess the question that you didn't ask that I would like to ask myself are what are the things it takes to be successful? And I would say that those five or six things are what it's going to take. Uh, the rest of it kind of falls into place if you have those if you have those five or six traits. Mm -hmm. There is no magic pill, people. There is no magic pill. Wealth cannot be created overnight. Fix and flip cannot be created overnight. Um, it's I think it's a slow process. This is a vehicle that you can do it. But at the end of the day, it's going to take time and you better wake up early and get at it. Thank you. Uh, could you tell us again about your sites and how we can find out more about you online? Thank you for asking about that. Mm -hmm. 
if you're a high net worth accredited investor and you want to invest alongside of me where my money is a first loss if that entices you with good solid returns of eight to ten percent i would encourage you to visit zincinvesting.com that's zincinvesting.com or give us a call here at the office 559-326-2509 our fund is doing exceptionally well. It produces passive returns of 8 to 10%. And my money's in there alongside your money. So for any investors out there, high net worth individual owner investors, I encourage you to give us a call or visit that site. If you are a borrower and you need a rental loan or a fix and flip loan, and we can help you, we can help you. We have plenty of cash on hand to help you. We would love for you to visit our website at zincfinancial.com. Or give us a call here at the office at 559-326-2509. We're here to help you learn. We're helping you to help you here with your marketing as well as your actual lending. And so I hope that either one of those channels, uh, we can be of assistance to anybody on your program that's listening today. Todd, if you could close us out with one word, no explanation, what word would that be? Grind. Grind. Thank Keep you so grinding. much, Todd. Thank Keep you. Grinding. I appreciate you. Jerome, have yourself an excellent day. I really appreciate you having me on the program. Um, I, I feel honored to be a guest in your presence today. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Todd. Thank you. Bye-bye.